Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy by John Allen Price Chapter 19 Master Ragathon, we were not expecting you, said Kalikobal. What do you wish? The Necromutant's remark brought the work detail around him to a sudden halt. The Tekrons, heretics, and other Necromutants all turned in unison and bowed to the small entourage that had just appeared at the main hangar's aft portal. I wish to depart this world with the receptacle. Ragathal growled. How much preparation is there left before this spacecraft is ready? Unlike his previous visits to the hangar, this time the Necromutant found it almost empty of the human aircraft and helicopters acquired by the Dark Legion. They had been moved into the various auxiliary hangars and bays to make room for the launch of the courier ship. It now stood on the transporter launch vehicle, free of the stacking gantry and with only a few service towers to steady it. Fueling lines were attached to its huge roof and belly-mounted booster rockets. The frost-like coating of ice on the lines indicated cryogenic propellants were still being pumped into them. Not much, my master said Kalikobal. We could almost take the receptacle aboard now and leave, except we haven't the power to finish pressurizing the fuel cells on the ship and its boosters, nor do we have the power to lift the pad to the surface. Shagul, can you tap into an electrical conduit and take the power we need? asked Ragathal. Turning to his lead Tekron, seconds later he had a telepathic response that briefly made him smile. Excellent. Have a crew begin work on it immediately. Kalikobal, what's happening down there? At the hangar's opposite end, a loud crashing caught everyone's attention, and it continued as more pieces of the launch pad's retractable dome fluttered down from the surface and impacted hard. The dome was damaged by an earlier attack, my master. The necromutant answered. It must be giving way. Have a crew move the wreckage to another hangar. I'll not have it delay me. Prepare for descent, said Alvarez, glancing out either side of her cockpit for a final check of the helicopter's position. Jeff, what are you reading? Radar altimeter indicates this shaft is at least 300 meters deep, said Taylor. Fire control radar shows it's straight-sided. No tapering or obstructions. Wreckage at the bottom may make landing tricky. I'm not worried about that. We'll hover if we have to. Wait, something's happening down there. I've got movement. I think we're going to have a welcoming committee. Open fire, ordered Alvarez. Use the tail gun. Switch the nose turret over to me. We're down, Captain announced the Loadmaster. Opening ramp. In the final moments of its descent, a heavy clunking shook the Hercules as its landing gear deployed. By comparison, the actual touchdown was quiet. Only when the transport settled off-level did everyone realize it had landed. By then, the tail ramp was opening and the first troops were charging down it. Fan out and make a perimeter, the captain shouted. There's going to be a lot of planes arriving here in the next few minutes. Sergeant, check that structure. Make sure none of those creatures are in it. Yes, sir, said Watts. Stay with me, kid. Running from the moment he stepped off the ramp, Watts was hundreds of feet in front of the other soldiers, deplaning from the lead flight of troop carriers. While the others moved cautiously, Watts had taken most of the squad out to a bunker that had only been hit minutes before by the escorting AH-19s. Sergeant, what were those things? asked the private, trying to pick his way among the slaughtered legionnaires. They look like they've been dead for a long time, longer than five minutes. From what the captain said, they probably were dead once, Watts advised, moving deeper into the bunker and scanning the bodies littering it for any signs they were still active. 
but this Dark Legion can't leave them buried. Now we're gonna have to do that job all over again. What's that, kid? The troop carriers, sir. They're lifting off. Watts returned to the bunker's gaping entrance in time to see the last of the lead Hercules flight rise into the air on its vertical lift jets. Coming behind them was another four transports. They were just finishing their transition from horizontal flight, lowering their landing gear, when green tracers erupted from the bunkers outside the perimeter line and the citadel itself. The Hercules nearest the citadel tried desperately to evade, but was caught in a cone of fire. Its T-tail and one of its stub wings was chopped apart, causing it to roll to the left and hit the ground nose first. As it exploded and scattered its burning wreckage and bodies across the landscape, the three surviving transports managed to touch down safely, only to be swept with cannon and rocket fire until more felines screamed in for revenge. Those guys better evac that ship fast, said Watts, nodding at the second Hercules to catch fire before it explodes. Sart, Lieutenant, what's that noise? The private said nervously. I've never heard anything like it before. Well, it certainly ain't coming from out here. Watts turned and looked back into the bunker, at the mouth of the tunnel he had only begun to investigate. The eerie yellow light that spilled out of it had grown harsher, and the inhumane wailing was growing louder by the second. I think we're going to have company. Defensive positions, everyone, the lieutenant shouted. Watts, Osborne, Gannon, down in front. Everyone else, protect our back until the captain arrives. Whatever these things are, don't let up until you know they're dead. Switching tail gun to night vision targeting, said Taylor. Give us a whirl, lieutenant. Hovering less than a dozen feet above the now exposed shaft, the CFAH-4 cutlass started to spin slowly to the left. Moments later, its tail gun opened fire, the long burst of tracers seemingly swallowed up in the depths of the shaft. Even though there was no visible response to the hail of shells, the helicopter dropped slowly into the shaft after it had completed its first rotation. Above it, the escorting CFAH-3 continued to orbit the launch facilities defensively. Its guns and other weapons were silent, though they swept the area for any sign of Legion forces. Fortunately, all combat appeared to be happening on the other side of the Citadel. For the horde of Tekrons and Necromutants who went to work on clearing the piles of debris, the storm of high-explosive and armor-piercing incendiary shells was unexpected. Because they brought no weapons with them, it was also a one-sided slaughter. Many were cut down just as they realized they were under attack, and still more fell as they ran for cover. Master, there's some type of gunship in the access shaft, shouted Kalikabal, running back to Regathal's entourage. That's obvious. The humans are more brazen than I ever considered, Regathal noted, looking past the Necromutant's bodies lying on the pad. Arm yourselves, and bring down these intruders. But my master, we have few weapons here. We're mostly workers and vehicle maintenance crews. Most of the armed units have gone to the surface to stop the main attack. I know that. In his wisdom, Azeroth has assigned few combat forces to me. Until I gather additional forces, you're to hold off these intruders with... Wait. As Ragathal turned to leave, his gaze swept across the group of heretics led by Kyle Mortis. Since their arrival at the Citadel, they had been under Ragathal's control and were assigned to spacecraft repair and preparation. When he discovered them, Ragathal smiled triumphantly. Excellent, Kalikabal. Arm these humans. He continued. They're the only ones who successfully challenged the Special Forces Squad at Atlantis. Do you think you can hold these off? Yes, my master. We could do better than hold them off, said Mortis, stepping forward and bowing. Give us the right weapons, and we'll defeat them. Kalikabal will see to your arming. On your lives, these intruders must not succeed in stopping me. Humans, these are weapons you can use, said Kalikabal, opening a locker and displaying rifles that had, that had not been warped and distorted by the Legion's black technology. Hurry and arm them. 
I can hear the noise of the Capitol helicopter growing louder. Overall analysis of Dark Legion activity, Watanabe asked when a flashing light near her seat indicated the computer had completed its assigned program. On one of the auxiliary screens, the response immediately appeared. Citadel air defenses are currently operating at less than 30% of estimated capacity, 89% possibility that the remaining Dark Legion ground forces are massing for a counterattack on the Capitol beachhead, insufficient data to predict outcome of Capitol assaults at this time, and analysis. Does this mean that Dark Legion could win? asked Ozawa, studying the same readout as Watanabe. There are more flights of Capital Strike fighters approaching the combat zone, she said. And while their contribution to the attack wasn't part of the analysis, the future is still in doubt. We must do what we can to tip the scales in the Capital's favor. Drone the Congo, target east portal of the Citadel structure, program maneuver Divine Wind. Attempt a maximum penetration of the target. Execute on my mark. The target Watanabe selected was one of the two main entrances on the Citadel's north face. Before the attack had begun, they had been the most complete on the fortress. The giant stone statues flanking them had only been in need of fine detailing. Now they were scarred by bomb blasts and blackened by napalm strikes. The portal frames had suffered similar damage but hordes of legionnaires, centurions, and other creatures still poured through them and came teeming down the stairs, trampling and crushing the bodies of those killed by earlier airstrikes. Only a strafing pass by FA-99s or grape shots would attract defensive fire from the legion forces. The hordes scarcely noticed the slim-bodied warhead as it streaked over them and flew inside the more heavily used of the two portals. Obeying its obstacle avoidance program, it managed to fly deep inside the increasingly narrow passageway, finally striking a roof support beam at high speed. The instantaneous mixture of raw fuel and red-hot engine parts created the thunderous fireball that consumed the munitions of those it overtook. In turn, they partly fed the explosion until it collapsed the passageway and blew out a massive plume of flame from the entrance. In the polar night's semi-darkness, it was visible for miles. And for a moment, it even intimidated the thinking creatures among the Legion hordes. Altitude 50 meters below ground level and continuing, Alvarez called out, glancing at the altitude readouts on her heads-up display. And so far, I'm not seeing anything threatening. Still continuing to spin slowly to the left, the cutlass was now over 160 feet inside the shaft. Enough auroral light filtering down from above for Alvarez and the others to see the shaft had a nearly featureless surface. No compartments or passageways appeared to be connected to it, except at the bottom. Lieutenant, I got movement, said Taylor, studying the green-tinted image on the tactical screen. A lot of it. I don't think I'm going to be able to counter it with a single machine gun. You want the nose turret? asked Alvarez. We better go with something bigger. Hunter advised, bringing up the same image on the terminal screen. Am fast. Arm a cluster bomb. Set submunitions for two-tier detonation. Ten seconds and sixty seconds. Delayed action. You got it, Mitch. Jeff, are you ready? Setting detonation times, said Taylor. And the computer confirms the weapon is armed. Seconds later, one of the gray pods mounted on the gunship's stub wings dropped into the shaft. At approximately 150 feet, a compressed gas charge tore it open and scattered the spherical bomblets about the shaft. Many bounced off its walls before landing on the pad, where half of them detonated on impact for several more seconds until the flashes stopped. Those gunships could see the shaft's bottom. Get down, Mortis shouted. That's a cluster bomb. The initial burst of explosions sounded like individual shotgun blasts. However, they repeatedly built to a thundering crescendo that shook everything in the main hangar. The waves of shrapnel the bomblets unleashed shredded the necromutants and armed Tekrons who were attempting to retake the pad. Some of their own munitions detonated along with the bomblets, adding to the destruction. The shrapnel reached far enough into the hangar 
to strike the courier ship and the transport vehicle it rested on. Fortunately, by then, the jagged lengths of metal had lost much of their velocity and bounced harmlessly off the targets. Our forces are seriously depleted, human, said Kalikabal, lifting himself off the floor. And the helicopter is still descending. What do you suggest? Set up defensive positions, said Mortis, and wait for the gunship to land. Then we'll kill them all before they even make it out of their ship. We'll present our master with victory before he can return with reinforcements. Sarge, these things don't die too easily, the private said, fearfully, hurriedly jamming another clip into his rifle while Watts continued snapping out quick bursts at the Legionnaires and other creatures. Tell me something I don't know, said Watts. Whatever you do, don't stop shooting them until they stop screaming. Hold it, Bob, hold it, shuddered one of the other fire support specialists. I think we've killed them all, at least for this wave. As the squad's weapons fell silent, the unearthly calm filled the bunker. None of the Legion casualties made any noise or moved, though many were burning. Outside the bunker, the battle had moved beyond it, covered by prowling flights of AH-19 gunships. Capital ground forces were moving on the Citadel itself. Their progress was slow, mostly because of sniper fire and piles of Legion bodies on the battlements and stairs. Hey, what happened to the lieutenant? Watts demanded when he turned and found the squad's medic tending to the officer. He didn't obey his own rules, said the medic. He got hit. We'll have to evac him and some others if they're to live. Well, guess who that leaves in charge of this squad? You, Big Bob, said Osborne. But before he advanced, the captain told me he wants us to stay here and cover this bunker, just in case these Legion things try to counterattack from the rear. Cover the rear, said Watts, incredulous. I haven't been part of a rear guard defense since I was the kid's age, and I ain't about to slide back into bad habits. Watts nodded in the private's direction while he walked over to the stockpile of munitions left behind from the squad and selected more belts of 15mm shells. Those he hung on the external clips attached to his body armor. Bob, what are you doing? asked Osborne. You disobeying orders? No, I'm reinterpreting them, said Watts entering the bunker and advancing through the field of Legion bodies to the tunnel's mouth. Seems to me if you want to keep these things from reappearing here, we should do it from as far inside this passage as we can. Call it a forward defense. Now is anyone going to join me? There goes the second wave of detonations, said Hunter, the moment he spotted a new eruption of flashes below the gunship. Get your repair gear ready. For once, we couldn't make a conventional landing, Captain? Rogers asked, reattaching a metal clamp to his waist harness. It would be easier. And under these conditions, impossible. There's too much wreckage on that pad for us to make a safe landing. If we have the time, we'll clear some of it and make a conventional takeoff. Everyone ready? Good. Julia, this is Mitch. Bring us to hover at 20 meters and get ready for a repelling. Seconds later, the cutlass stopped its descent and its side doors rolled open. The pylons over the side hatches snapped out again and dropped their lines. Hunter and three other members of his squad slid down the lines to the pad some 60 feet below. Because the shaft concentrated the helicopter's rotor wash, they dropped into a whirlwind of dust and smoke, almost too thick to see through. Had they not been wearing goggles, they would have been blinded. As it was, they only saw the wreckage-strewn pad in the last moment of their repelling. They landed, detached their clamps, and spread out to cover various entrances to the shaft. They were joined by the rest of the squad less than half a minute later, who concentrated around the main hangar's entrance and waited for the helicopter to lift away. As the dust cloud gradually settled, Hunter signaled them to advance. The sound, it's growing weaker, Kalikabal noted. The war machine isn't landing. What's happening, human? I, I don't understand, said Mortis, looking up from the part of the stacking gantry that had been thrown down as a barrier. Maybe they aborted the landing when they realized it was too dangerous. 
These are special forces, Kyle, said Dor, just like we encountered at the spaceport. And they don't give up. We may not see them, but they're out there. Yes, Shagul claims there are humans at the opposite end, Kalikabal reported after turning to the lead Tekron and receiving a flood of telepathic information. There are only a few. We easily outnumber them. Advance now and we can destroy them before our master returns. Kalikabal filled his lungs with air and let out a long, shrill wail that echoed through the hangar. The other necromutants gave answering cries and together with the remaining Tekrons moved out from their cover. What the hell was that? Rogers asked when the attack cry reached their position. Never mind, said Hunter. Check your motion detectors. Jake, Diane, what are you seeing? You're right, Captain. That was a Gamma-class courier ship down there, Shacker reported, scanning the hangar's opposite end with his rifle scope. And it's stacked, ready to launch. There isn't much else in here, Parker added, doing the same procedure. All of the other planes and spaceships must have been moved to those auxiliary hangars. I do see parts of a vehicle assembly gantry, and there's movement around them. I got movement as well, said Rogers, sweeping the detector in a limited arc. A lot of it. Several groups. And they're all moving this way. Let's use this cover to set up a crossfire while we still have it, Hunter ordered. I want everyone to be careful using your armor-piercing rounds. That courier's probably fueled and no grenades, except for Leo's flamers. While Rogers pointed out the location of each Dark Legion unit, Hunter indicated where he wanted his teams to position themselves. As the dust storm ebbed and settled, the cavernous dimensions of the hangar became more apparent. It was the size of several sports stadiums, which was made even more apparent by the lack of any other aircraft or spacecraft except for the courier ship. Scattered across the hangar floor, were pieces of skeletal stacking gantry, a few tow vehicles, and roller-mounted shelves of tools. Among these, the Legion units prowled, until the Necromunes shrieked their attack cries once more. Let him have it, Hunter shouted, training his M50 assault rifle on the nearest group of hulking monsters. A deafening barrage of rifle and machine gun fire filled the hangar, and at first, the only Necromutants and Tekrons to fall were hit by the snipers and Halston. Then, the napalm hand grenades began exploding. Blossoms of flame erupted in and among the Legion units, showering their members with burning jelly. In the hangar's semi-darkness, they became obvious targets. Those who did not die from the immolation were chopped apart by gunfire. Captain, I think they're falling back said Rogers, noting the pattern of movement on his motion detector. Let's keep up the pressure, said Hunter. Advance. Watch your flanks and watch each other. Moving carefully from their positions, the squad's team kept firing on the Legion units and covered each other. Even though the units were retreating, some of their members continued to attack. And Hunter found himself facing a necromutant covered in fire. Die, damn it, die! He shouted, emptying his rifle's clip into the doomed creature. It stumbled, but kept advancing, this time in the direction of the gunfire. Hunter feverishly worked the pump of his rifle's grenade launcher. When he squeezed the trigger again, a high explosive grenade struck the necromutant in the chest and tore it apart. Captain, I thought we weren't supposed to use rifle grenades, said Harris after dodging the shower of burning flesh. Sometimes even I have to disobey my own orders. Leo, what do you have there? I thought it was a dead legionnaire or something, said Venetti, crouching beside a body obviously smaller than the Necromutants and Tekrons. But it's someone. I mean, it's human. Or it was human. Never mind. I know what you mean, said Hunter, reloading his assault rifle and crossing over Venetti's location. Good God, it is human not some reanimated corpse. But in this place, he's probably a heretic, Wendy advised, joining the others. As impossible as it sounds for those like him, this hell may be their goal. Well, if this is where they'd like to be, then let's leave them all here. Spread out and pass the word. Be suspicious of any human we come across. 
except for Lorraine Colvin. Master Agathal, we've been successful at holding off the humans, said Clickaball at the moment he felt the Neferet's presence behind him, and they've not damaged your ship. Because they probably know in destroying it, they would destroy themselves, said Ragathal as he re-entered the hangar. And you've not defeated them? I sense they are but one squad. I have few combat forces to command, my master. The Tekron are dedicated, but their only skills are as workers. I've lost many, and most of the Necromutants under me. I see no reinforcements with you, my master. Are we to receive any? Soon. Not what I wanted, but they'll do. Azeroth is keeping all his immaculate furies around the command nexus, as he expects capital ground forces to penetrate that far into his citadel. However, I have more faith than he. I wish to view these intruders before they're consumed. Are you sure this is wise, my master? Mortis inquired. These are capital special forces. I know what they are, said Ragathal, giving Mortis an irritated look. And I still wish to view them before they're nothing. Both Ekmerias and Kalikabal tried to voice similar concerns, but were brushed aside by Ragathal. Glancing briefly at the spaceship it held, he moved past the huge transport vehicle and around the gantry sections, until he was in front of them, and had a commanding view of the rest of the hangar. Captain, I got movement near the transport vehicle, Shacker advised, sweeping the hangar's opposite end from his newest position. Sure seems to be more of it down there than around here, said Hunter, moving over to his snipers. What do you have? More necromutants and tech things. Wait a second, I got some big guy with spikes coming out of his head. I think it's one of them Nephorites. If you're right, that isn't a Nephorite. It's THE Nephorite. Remember what Porteus told us. They're the Legion's generals, and only one commands a citadel. You think you can nail him? At this range, you bet, said Shacker before glancing at Parker. Take out one of those necromutants, Diane. The guy with the spikes is mine. Neither Parker nor Shacker bothered to deploy the bipods on their SR-50 improved M89s. Instead, they balanced the heavy weapons on the horizontal frame piece of the gantry section they were using for cover. Additional sections and other obstacles made it difficult for Parker to take aim on one of the shorter necromutants. Shacker, however, had no trouble in lining up on the taller Nephorite. In spite of the differences in their targets, both opened fire within seconds of each other. I don't need those, Ragathal growled, rejecting the heretic's offer of night vision binoculars. I see the intruders quite well. There are some now. They make good use of the available cover. They... Bright muzzle flashes among the group Ragathal pointed to caught his full attention. In an instant, he knew exactly who the fire was directed at and dropped to the ground. The armor-piercing incendiary shells whipped past him barely a second later and impacted one of the transport vehicle's tractor treads. They easily punched through the rubber outer coverings, but smashed noisily into the thick steel plates. The holes started smoking as each shell's rod of plastic explosive ignited and burned the surrounding rubber. My master, are you all right? Asked Mortis, crawling over to where Ragathal huddled. Of course I am, he said. They'll have to do better than that to injure or kill me. Kalikabal, what's affecting you? I, I can feel them burning, my master, said the necromutant, holding his chest and staggering to his feet. I, I don't understand how the humans can do this to me. Smoke curled out from around Kalikabal's fingers. When it increased, he pounded his chest as if it would extinguish the fire spreading through him. But his biochemical systems were unable to cope with the damage, even with his futile help. He stumbled into the gantry section and toppled it as he burst into flames. These humans must have better weapons than we encountered in the past, said Ragathal, after moving behind the relative safety of the transport vehicle. 
It's no surprise that they now feel emboldened enough to strike out at us in our domain. Should we counterattack, my master? Ekmerias requested, also seeking protection under the massive vehicle. No need. The Nafi have arrived. A rhythmic fluttering, barely audible above the sounds of the gunfire, accompanied Ragathal's answer. In the hangar's back entrance, a swarm of balloon-like creatures appeared. They were covered with fin-like projections, the largest of which flapped like hummingbird wings to keep them airborne. Their large eyes glowed pale red in the hangar's low light, and their jaws appeared frozen in menacing grins which exposed their interlocking sets of triangular teeth. The Nafi flew past the Legion personnel in regular flocks. Their prey lay deeper inside the cavern. Captain, I got a lot of movement now, said Rogers. But it's not like anything I've seen before. I'm not reading individuals or groups. It's like a cloud. Is it a chemical attack? Parker asked, reaching for her gas mask. Should we break these out? No, this gas sensor can detect agents down to three parts per trillion, Wendy answered, grabbing a bulb-like device hanging out of her medical kit. And so far, it isn't ringing on anything. Lieutenant, don't get out in front of us, said Hunter. We don't know what you're reading. What could it be, Mitch? asked Rogers. It's not like anything solid, and we've stopped drawing fire. Though he kept to the available cover, Rogers had moved several dozen feet ahead of the squad. He swept continually with his motion detector, holding it in one hand, and his iron fist heavy automatic in the other. The increasing lull in the gunfire from the Dark Legion forces caused them to move forward more aggressively. By the time the hundreds of sets of glowing red eyes became visible, he was out of effective coverage of most of the squad members. My god, they're alive! Shaka whispered as many of the eyes seemed to converge on Rogers. God, please help me! He screamed. Somebody help me! Dozens of Nafi attacked him simultaneously, each making a slashing pass and carrying away what appeared to be a strip of clothing. And after the dozens came hundreds, especially when Rogers emptied his automatic in a wild burst. The Nafi grew more frenzied in their attack, several attaching themselves to him as he collapsed. They're alive, said Harris, leveling his submachine gun at the dimly visible creatures. Even though a thick cloud of Nafi swirled above Rogers, only a few were hit by all the rounds fired. Those either exploded or fluttered to the ground like leaves. Many of the rest streamed to Harris's position. The same thing happened when Venetti and Halston opened fire. Succeeding waves of Nafi closed on them, often colliding with each other and various obstacles in an effort to reach the soldiers. Fall back, Hunter demanded. Fall back, damn it, and stop shooting. They're attracted to it. The ground they had fought so hard to gain was now rapidly given up as the squad abandoned their positions and ran. The action appeared to confuse the Nafi for a few seconds, then they wheeled around in their buzzing clouds and dove after their prey. Why are they going after anyone who fires a gun? Vanetti asked, catching up to Hunter. It's gotta be the heat, said Hunter. They must see an infrared better than visible light. Well, if it's heat they want, they'll get it. Vanetti produced one of the flamer grenades and set its detonation time to one second. He pulled its safety pin and heaved it over his shoulder, arcing it high into the air. It detonated in mid-flight, producing a blossom of flame among the Nephi clouds. Their response to it was like predatory moths to a freshly lit candle. They attacked the fireball as well as their own kind, who were caught in it, and burned. Then the fireball burned out, and for a few critical seconds, the Nephi swarm wheeled around in a confused state. Everyone. Set your flamer grenades at one second and toss them as high as you can, Hunter ordered, twisting the detonation post on one of his grenades down to its minimum indicated time. We need air bursts. Halston, stop firing. That's like using a cannon to hit flies. Yeah, we both got something better than these, Theodore, said Shacker, dropping his improved M89 and reaching for a pistol grip just visible over his left shoulder. Diane, grab your street blaster. 
the weapon Shacker pulled out of the holster, mounted on his shoulder plate, was barely 18 inches long. Its tubular magazine was exactly the same length as its barrel, and its receiver was just large enough to contain a semi-automatic mechanism and move the shells from magazine to breech. The Street Blaster shotgun looked diminutive in Shacker's huge hands, but when he squeezed the trigger, it barked like a small cannon and unleashed a fountain of pellets on the approaching swarm. Nearly a dozen Nafi either exploded from being hit or fluttered to the ground. It was an insignificant number compared to the waves of creatures. Fortunately, many of them were temporarily drawn off by another napalm fireball. That's it, said Hunter. Everyone, defensive circle. Break out your street blasters and riot ammo. Wendy, toss out some flares. Let's see if it'll confuse them. They show remarkable cohesion, Ragathal noted, moving forward enough to observe the Special Forces squad trying to fight off their attackers. In the past, the Nafi have inspired terror in human victims. These aren't fleeing in panic. They're different from most of the humans we've encountered. Master Ragathal, now is the time we should attack, said Mortis, stepping up to the Nephirite. In that defensive formation, they're vulnerable. If we could get close enough, we'd kill them all in one action. Very good, heretic. At first, Ragathal gave Mortis an angry stare. Then, as the plan was explained further, his serene smile returned. Gather your people and move on the intruders. If the Nephi can hold them there long enough, you will destroy them. Hurry, damn it, hurry, said Hunter, slapping a clip loaded with green cap bullets into his assault rifle. They're returning. The lull in the Nafi attack only lasted a few moments. Once the latest fireball burned out, they wheeled en masse for the squad's position, which had coalesced into a tightly packed ring. The reloading with anti-personnel munitions had only just ended when the swarm dived into several flocks and dove on their prey. Their buzzing and chattering remained soft, but grew omnipresent, until the rifles and shotguns drowned them out. Every weapon emitted a hail of tiny pellets, even the submachine guns and rifles. They shredded the leading wave of creatures and caused the rest to back up and collide with one another. The Nafi became further disoriented as Wendy ignited flares and heaved them out of the ring. Like dogs chasing a stick, small groups would break off from the swarm and follow each flare. Wherever it landed, they would cluster trying to devour it until either it was burned out or a napalm grenade bounced next to them and detonated. Soon the air was thicker with smoke than Nafi, and the rancid smell of their burning bodies even caused them to slowly disperse. Despite the weaker attacks, the squad remained in its defensive formation. They stood so close the armor plates on their arms and shoulders would often rub together. Stay in position. I still hear them out there, Hunter warned the buzzer-like fluttering drifting around with the smoke. I'm hearing something else too, Captain, said Halston. Only, it ain't no flying piranha. All right, everyone who doesn't have shotguns, reload with AP ammo. Following his own orders, Hunter pulled his last partial clip of green cap shot shells from his rifle and stowed it. He had just finished reloading a clip of armor-piercing rounds when he heard footsteps beyond the defensive ring. We got company. Break ranks and... Ow! Damn it! The muzzle flashes were barely visible in the smoke. What was more visible were the sparks from the bullets ricocheting off Hunter's breastplate. The force of the impacts and the pain they caused him sent him tumbling to the ground. He managed to raise an arm to protect his face and felt around glance off its armor before landing on his back. In the seconds that followed the initial attack, the rest of his squad dove for cover and returned fire. The smoke was not thick enough to hide movement, but made aiming difficult. For the screams and crashing they heard, the squad could be sure of only one kill, until a charging figure seemed to materialize on top of them. We've already defeated your kind once, shouted Dor. This time you die. As he leveled his Bauhaus assault rifle at Wendy, his foot landed on a still flapping Nafi. Its teeth managed to bite straight through his shoe into his toes, causing him to scream, 
lose balance and make a skidding crash into Halston. Too close for guns, he said, reaching for a scabbard strapped to his left leg. Switching to knives, the survival knife Halston drew glinted dully as it flashed into Dor's neck. It caught him just below his chin and plunged in all the way to its hilt. He could manage only a partial cry before his vocal cords were smashed, and he gripped the handle so tightly Halston had to fight so he could free his own hand. Dor thrashed around and let out a few loud sputterings before dying. Mitch, are you alright? Wendy asked, sliding over to where Hunter lay. I think so, he answered. I'm gonna have to let Sherman know they also build good armor. Leo, there's another one. Dor was still in his death spasms when another heretic seemed to magically appear. A burst of submachine gun fire caught him in the chest and threw him back into a gantry section. What he screamed was unrecognizable, except for, Kyle, help me! With his death, the other heretics moving in the shadows appeared to withdraw. How did they do that? Vanity asked. The last one got close enough to kill me with a penknife. Remember what Porteus told us about heretics, said Wendy. If their service to the Legion is exemplary, they're granted dark gifts. I think what we just saw were examples of those gifts. And did you hear what the first guy said? Shacker questioned. That they defeated our kind once before? These must be the heretics we encountered at the spaceport. If they are, then this is a grudge fight, said Hunter, getting off his back but staying behind the available cover. And we all know what those are like. So don't get carried away. Stay professional and move out. I want everyone to look for Rogers. I know he's probably not alive, but we gotta confirm that. And we need his gear. The Nafi have failed, Ragathal snarled, glancing up at the hangar's roof and watching the scattered creatures dart around haphazardly. It appears as though animals designed for mass attacks are unable to do so when their numbers fall below a certain level. In the future, we must do some genetic reprogramming. Clearly upset, Ragathal was able to maintain his serenity until one of the Nafi flew close enough to notice him turn toward him and hovered in front of his face. It emitted a soft chittering that sounded like pathetic whimpering. The Nephrite reached out as if to touch it, but when his arm finished extending, the creature started to shudder and screeched in pain. Ragathal had opened a portal inside its body to the dark dimensions. The heat the portal generated cooked the Nephi from inside out. And when its body finally dropped to the ground, the brittle remains collapsed into ashes. The heretics appear to be meeting with some success, my master, said Ekmeriaz. It's difficult to tell. Contact the Nexus again, said Ragathal, smiling at his small triumph. Tell them we need more reinforcements. These intruders are proving more resourceful than anyone estimated. And do it directly. I do not want to wait for a dispatched messenger to return. Captain, over here, Redfield advised, motioning where he and Halston stood. Someone's crying. Moving again between his teams, Hunter turned away from his snipers and approached his fire support specialist. Halston and his assistant were crouching next to a figure, the first they had encountered that was alive and not carrying a gun. As Hunter joined them, it tried to crawl further under a gantry section. It's a woman, Captain, said Halston. You think it's Lorraine Coven? No, she looks older and taller than Lorraine should be, said Hunter, laying down his rifle and trying to move forward. Taller? How can you tell she's taller from the way she's curled up? Help me, please, begged Monica Lewis in a scared, quivering voice. Why did these people kidnap me? Who are they? Where am I? Captain, do you think they kidnapped more than one person? Redfield asked. Maybe they got a bunch down here for experiments. You all look so strong and handsome. Please protect me from these things, please. I'll love you forever if you'll do it. As Lewis continued to plead, she moved out from her hiding place. What she had said, she almost purred. 
It made Hunter and the others forget where they were, that they were in the middle of combat. The deception continued until a thunderous explosion jolted them. What the? Diane, are you crazy? Hunter shouted when he realized a hole had been torn in Monica's chest and the impact was lifting her off the ground. You just murdered her. Damn right I did, said Parker, a smoking street blaster in her hand. Take a look at what she's holding. As Lewis's body finished sagging to the floor, a metallic clatter sounded when her hand at last released the aggressor automatic she had been pulling out from under her clothing. In a belated response to its appearance, Halston and Redfield pointed their weapons at the body. Protect me and I'll love you forever, Parker repeated, an edge of sarcasm in her voice. Get real, guys. How could you fall for a line like that? It must have been some sort of dark gift spell, said Hunter, grabbing the heretic's automatic and pulling the clip out of it before tossing it away. Apparently, they can seduce as easily as invoke pain. We must... God, are you feeling that? A sustained quake-like vibration shook the huge hangar long enough and severe enough to cause the stacked courier ship and external boosters to sway perceptibly and for the dust to filter down from the cracks that had opened in the ceiling. It also caused the scattered gunfire the squad was drawing from the Dark Legion forces to briefly fall silent. Come on, let's find Lorraine Coven and get out of here, Hunter continued, before our guys bring the whole citadel down on top of us. What's the answer from the Nexus? Ragathal asked when his chief necromutant returned to his side. When can I expect more reinforcements? There will be no more, my master, Ekmeria said hesitantly. My exchange with them was cut off in mid-sentence, with sounds of explosions. I fear what we felt was the destruction of the command nexus. Yes, I register a disturbance in the forces of the Dark Symmetry. Instead of displaying anger, Ragathal gave in to an emotion he had rarely experienced before, apprehension. There can be only one answer for it. Azeroth has been killed. A Nephrite murdered? How is that possible? We are not immortal. What I suffered on Luna should have been proof enough. My brother chose not to heed my experience and has paid for it. What will happen now to us, my master? asked Igmiriaz fear growing in his voice. All will be anarchy. Chaos, Ragathal shouted, holding his head as if it were throbbing with pain. Coordination of the Citadel's defenses will collapse. I can feel the orderliness of the dark symmetry unraveling. The Nephorite staggered as if under physical assault. He turned and wandered far enough away from the massive transport to expose himself to hostile fire. Only after several rounds had passed close to him did Ragathal come back to his senses and return serenely to cover. By then, the apprehension and pain were gone, and he was smiling triumphantly. Yes, it's dangerous, but it can be done, he said to himself. Then he turned to Ekmeriaz. With the remaining force, you're to hold the intruders here and defeat them if possible. I'll retrieve the receptacle and take her to my nether room. Captain, something's happening, Shacker warned, keeping his eye fixed to his scope's view screen. That guy with the spikes is leaving the hangar. Damn, I almost had a clean shot at him. I hope it means the rest of the attack is going well. And he had to leave for a little crisis management, said Hunter, sliding up beside him and raising his night scope to his eye. We should try to keep track of him, Captain, said Wendy. I suspect, wherever he is, Lorraine Coven will be. Remember, she was valuable enough to the Dark Legion for an entire Bauhaus base to be destroyed. You're right. Jake, make a note of where this guy goes. If we get out of here, we'll want to follow him. Leo, what do you have? A prisoner, Vanetti answered standing beside an unarmed man who was not wearing a uniform or body armor. He didn't have a gun, and he surrendered as soon as we came upon him. I thought you might want to question him about what's happening. Good idea, said Hunter, lowering his rifle when he realized Harris was standing behind the prisoner. Whoever you are, 
Don't give me any garbage about your citizens' rights. Answer my questions and you'll live. What was going on here before we arrived? Our master was planning to leave this world, said Mortis. You have interfered with that. Who's your master and what's he doing now? Our master is he who commands us and he's awaiting your death, which I am blessed to give him. As Mortis finished his answer, Hunter felt a wave of pain sweep through him. It took away his voice and ability to control his movements. He never felt gravity as strong as it suddenly became, and in spite of his efforts to fight it, he sagged to the floor. When he managed to raise his head, he discovered everyone else was similarly affected, except for Mortis. Die, unbelievers, now none shall stand in the way of the master, he said, stretching out his hand. You first, Hunter angrily replied, and for a moment the pain subsided. It was long enough for him to raise his assault rifle and squeeze the trigger. The burst was not well aimed, but at least part of it stitched across the heretic's stomach and chest. The impacts were enough to lift Mortis off his feet and send him tumbling over Harris's back. By the time he finished sprawling across the floor, the spell he had cast was ebbing away to an irritation. Captain, we got company, said Parker, dropping her rifle and going for her street blaster again. And Ted just capped off his belt. Hunter looked up to see Halston use his empty machine gun as a club on a sword-wielding heretic. Redfield had just enough time to reload his weapon before spraying two heretics who seemingly came out of nowhere. Hunter got an inkling of something closing in on his back, and as he turned, he caught sight of Vinetti leveling his Car 24 SMG at him. Get your head down, Captain! Get your head down! He shouted, barely giving his commander time to comply before opening up. With the Car 24 SMG muzzle less than a dozen feet in front of him, its deafening staccato was almost the only thing Hunter could hear. He thought he heard a curious banging sound of bullets striking metal. It was not until he glanced over his shoulder that he could confirm the noise. The heretic sailing backward carried a bullet-scarred sword in his hands. Somebody stop him, said Wendy, trying to hide behind an overturned set of tool shelves. He's after me. The heretic kicked the shelves out of the way and trained his rifle on Levine. By the time a barrage of shotgun pellets and 10 millimeter bullets shredded his upper body, she scrambled and rolled to get out of the way of the gruesome remains as they flopped to the ground. I've never seen it before, but short people do move faster than tall people, said Shacker, feeling the unnatural quiet after the attack ended. That'll be enough, ordered Hunter, stifling a small ripple of laughter. Watch the perimeter. That may or may not have been the last of the heretics. Jack, Diane, sweep the area for movement before we advance. This is going to become tiresome. We better find what's left of Raymond soon and salvage his equipment. Corporal, Drone Nagato has detected something unusual, Ozawa advised when one of his reconnaissance warheads prowling the Citadel area deviated from its random search pattern. It's those Special Forces helicopters again, said Watanabe, punching up the warhead's various camera views on one of her auxiliary screens. Looks like they're orbiting the old launch pad. I wonder why. They're directly over the open shaft. One even fired on the Dark Legion unit when it appeared in this area. I think that something's happening inside the shaft. Where does it lead? We believe to one or more hangars. Watanabe glanced up at the tactical screen and noticed the lack of any other activity around the launch site. But we've never been sure. Looks like Capital Special Forces are going to find out. Should we send the drone into the pad shaft, Corporal? Ozawa asked. It could easily fit down it. Compared to what we've been sending them down recently, of course we can. Watanabe slowly answered as she thought it over. No, if we put a drone in the shaft, we might not be able to get it back out. This is a special forces mission, and they get touchy when you interfere with them. I've lost a couple of drones in the past because of it. Instruct Nagato to keep this area under surveillance at normal safe distance. There's plenty of other activities for us to concern ourselves with. Captain, I think we found Raymond, said Parker, 
her voice uncharacteristically weak and quivering. What's left of him? On point again, she had moved the furthest into the hangar, more than two-thirds of the way into it, when she stopped and slumped against a portable power cart. Shacker was the first to reach her, followed by Hunter and the rest of the squad. What they found of Rogers was some armor and tattered, blood-soaked uniform inlaid with bones and shredded flesh. Hunter quickly realized the sight was numbing his people. Jack, Diane, Ted, move forward and form a perimeter, he ordered. Now, move it. We'll take care of this. We always made fun of him, Vanetti said quietly, somberly. We didn't always take him into our confidences, but we never hated him. He didn't deserve to die this way. Nobody does. Though I think in the future, more soldiers will die this way in our battles with the Legion. Using his bayonet, Hunter cut out and otherwise dislodged as much of the equipment Rogers carried as was possible. Most of this doesn't look like it was touched. Yes, I don't think those flying mouths have much of a taste for plastic or microchips, said Wendy. Using her canteen, she washed the blood off the gear Hunter was salvaging. We've got his motion detector, EM scanner, and the tracker for our emergency beacons. Is this all we take? I think so. We'll have to leave this, Hunter replied, pulling a tactical radio out of Roger's backpack and popping open its access panel. But I'll make sure no one can use it. While the radio had an almost indestructible plastic armor case, its open panel made it easy for Hunter to use his rifle's buttstock to smash its sensitive, classified electronics into so much silicon rubble. Is there anything else we have to take? Wendy added. Just one more thing, said Hunter. I'm not going for his identity chip, just the traditional tags. Slipping his bayonet over the neck rim of Roger's breastplate, he probed what remained of the body until he fished out a thin, blood-covered chain. Hunter unlocked the clasp and slid it off his neck. He washed the chain and gold-plated identity tag, welded to it with water from his canteen, before sliding it into an ammo pouch on his harness. I've never gotten used to this, he continued. Thank God I haven't lost a lot of people from the units I've commanded. All right, let's move it. We're closer to that spaceship now, so watch your fire. Jake, Diane, you got any movement to report on? Mutant Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy By John Allen Price Chapter 19 End